Ernest Hemingway famously said, the first panacea for mismanaged nation is inflation. The second is war. Ronald Reagan called inflation a mugger, an armed robber, a hitman. It was not long ago when the received wisdom of Wall Street was that inflation, like smallpox, belonged only to the history books. Then came 2022, the year in which inflation mounted a major comeback, reaching levels that have not been seen for 40 years. However, over the past month, the stock market has recovered on the view that inflation has peaked and that the worst is behind us. How much of this is wishful thinking and how much of it is grounded in reality? With traders and central bankers seemingly at odds over what it will take for inflation to return to earth, who will be proved right and who wrong? And what will this mean for your money? I'm David Wu, a former Wall Street strategist with a 20-year track record of making actionable predictions about major global change. Welcome to The Money Game, where I take on groupthink, propaganda, conspiracy theories in my critical analysis of markets, economics, and politics. Before we begin, please hit subscribe and the bell button so that you will be notified when a new video comes out. The notion that inflation may have peaked has gained currency following the release of the July inflation data for the Americas. In the U.S., headline consumer price inflation came in at 8.5%, down from 9.1% in June. This was the biggest drop in more than two years. In Canada, consumer price inflation also declined in July, from 8.1% to 7.6%, the first drop in a year. Brazil, South America's largest economy, inflation on a month-on-month -month basis fell at the fastest rate in July since 1980. Outside the Americas, though, there are no signs yet that inflation has turned a corner. In Europe, consumer price inflation in the Eurozone rose to 8.9% in July, the first time that inflation is running faster in the Eurozone than in the U.S. since 2015. In the U.K., inflation reached double digits in July for the first time in 40 years. In Asia, inflation also tracked higher in July, even though it is at a lower level than in other regions. Inflation in South Korea climbed to 6.3% in July, a 24-year high. Even China saw an uptick in inflation to 2.7%. Whether inflation has peaked or not, two of the three main drivers of inflation are going into reverse, at least for the moment. One is the disruption of the global supply chain. Notwithstanding some bottlenecks like U.S. rail freight delays and port strikes in Germany, there has been a significant easing of the disruption. For example, the number of days cargo tankers are at anchor and at berth at the port of Long Beach, the largest container terminal in America, has fallen to just four days from a peak of 30 days in 2021. This is also evidenced by the fact that the average cost of shipping a 40-foot container has dropped from over $10,000 to just $7,000. The prices paid component of the monthly manufacturing survey by the Institute for Supply Management has declined in line with the reported reduced time for supply delivery. The second big driver of inflation in 2022 has been a massive spike in commodity prices that was largely associated with the Western sanctions on Russia. Although no American or European politicians will ever admit it, there has been some easing of the sanctions evidenced by the shrinking of the discount of Russian crude oil relative to the international benchmark. This has helped push oil price down by 25%. Oil prices not alone, the raw industrial commodity index by the Commodity Research Bureau is down by nearly 10% from its high. Prices paid by U.S. manufacturers have declined to the lowest level in two years in line with the moderation in industrial commodity prices. Meanwhile, with the resumption of Ukraine's wheat export from a Black Sea ports, the price of wheat and other cereals has declined sharply. Let's assume for the time being that commodity prices don't go back up and that we don't see further disruptions of the global supply chain. Will this mean that inflation will go into reverse? <music> to answer this question, let's first strip out the effects of energy and food prices. What we have here is a chart of the so-called core inflation that excludes food and energy. Certainly for countries like Japan, China, and Switzerland, where core inflation is less than 2%, we can probably safely assume that inflationary pressure will dissipate very quickly if energy and food prices stabilize near current levels. But these countries are the exception rather than the rule. Even if we just focus on the developed countries on this chart, you can see that core inflation is extremely high, especially in the Anglo-Saxon countries. Core inflation is at 6.2% in the UK, 5.9% in the US, 5.5% in Canada, and 5.3% in Australia. 
What these countries have in common is the fact that they all happen to have very low unemployment rates. The unemployment rate is 3.4% in Australia, 3.5% in the US, 3.8% in the UK, and 4.9% in Canada. For Australia and the UK, this is the lowest level since 1974. For Canada, this is the lowest level since 1976. In the US, this is the lowest level since the 1960s. Lower unemployment rate means higher wage growth because workers have more bargaining power. The Atlanta Fed's wage tracker shows that wages in the US are growing at 7% right now, the fastest rate over their data set that starts in 1998. By the way, this is true regardless of skill levels, regardless of industries, regardless of part-time or full-time jobs. Higher wage growth pushes up inflation for services that tend to be more labor-intensive. It should come as no surprise that U.S. core services inflation is currently running at 5.5%, the highest level in 30 years. In developed countries, spending on services like healthcare and housing is a much higher share of household spending than on goods like clothing or electronics. For example, in the U.S., spending on services has a weighting of 73% in the calculation of core inflation. What this means is that for inflation to moderate, we need to see wage growth moderate. Or else being equal, this means that unemployment rate must go up. Put differently, the easing of supply chain disruption and the easing of sanctions against Russia alone will not be able to bring inflation back down to where it was before 2022. Since unemployment rates are key to the direction future inflation will take, and since higher unemployment rate is a necessary condition for bringing down inflation, we need to ask the question, what will bring up unemployment rates? The answer is very simple. Higher interest rates, or as is known on Wall Street, tighter monetary policy. On this chart here, I plotted core inflation against the growth rate of money supply. You can see is that there's a very clear positive correlation between the two. In other words, countries like Brazil and the U.S. that saw the biggest increase in money supply growth over the last two and a half years are now seeing the highest core inflation. In contrast, countries like Switzerland and Japan that have seen slower money supply growth have also lower core inflation right now. This chart lends support to the view that the underlying inflation problem today is a monetary phenomenon. In other words, too much stimulus, money printing, has driven the unemployment rates to levels that are too low and wage growth to levels that are too high to be consistent with low inflation. Some people are pointing to the sharp slowdown in money supply growth in 2022 as a reason why we don't need additional monetary tightening to take care of inflation. What they miss in the analysis is that the effects of the increase of money supply takes time to play out. The massive increase in money supply over the past two and a half years has been so great that we can expect its inflationary effects to linger on for years. Central banks must raise interest rates by a lot more to have a fighting chance for bringing inflation back down to 2%, a level that is seen as neither too high nor too low. If history provides any guide, over the past 70 years, Fed hiking cycles have never ended without real Fed funds rate returning to positive territory. Right now, the interest rates futures market is betting that the Fed funds rate will peak at 3.5% in this cycle at the end of this year. With headline inflation at 8.5% and core inflation at 5.9%, if the market turns out to be correct, this will represent a major break from the experience of the past 70 years. The only way this could happen is if the economy goes into a recession at the start of 2023. Over the past 70 years, the Fed has never raised interest rates when the economy was already in a recession. Indeed, with U.S. GDP contracting in the first and the second quarter, the consensus on Wall Street right now is that there's a 40% chance of a U.S. recession in the next 12 months. I have two major issues with the current convoluted market logic regarding Fed policy, inflation, and recession. Number one. 3.5% Fed funds rate is not high enough to push the U.S. economy into a recession. For one thing, in real terms, interest rates are still extremely low. Moreover, the balance sheets of U.S. households, U.S. corporations, and U.S. banks are at their strongest at any time over the past 20 years. This means that they can withstand much higher interest rates. If the bond market is right that a recession is on the way, it hasn't bothered to tell the stock market with the credit market. The rally of the stock market and the credit market since the end of June has eased financial conditions, making a recession even less likely. It is difficult to see how the bond market and the stock market can be both right right now. The bottom line, the recent easing of supply chain disruptions and sanctions against Russia has mitigated some of the concerns about 
runaway inflation. However, it's a mistake to think that this means that central banks are now off the hook. Indeed, the opposite is true. Lower food and lower energy inflation equals higher real purchasing power and lower risk of a recession. This should allow central banks to keep raising interest rates to cool the overheated labor market. What this means for investors is very simple. Brace for higher rates and underperformance of interest rate sensitive stocks like the tech sector. The main risk to this view is this. If geopolitical tension boils over, it will send the global economy into a premature recession. Check out my other videos to see why this risk is non-trivial. If you got something out of this program, please hit like and subscribe to my free YouTube channel. If you want to learn more about my investment strategy, come check us out at davidwuunbound.com. Thank you for listening.